Hello, friends, and welcome to the second of three Advent studies, Contemplating Advent, brought to you from Shiloh United Methodist Church in Piedmont, South Carolina. I'm Pastor Mike Hammett. I'll be leading you in the study today with production assistance from David Watson, our Director of Music Ministries and Pianist. At the beginning of this study, you heard the familiar tune of We Three Kings. And the refrain that you heard has words something like this, guide us to thy perfect light. My hope and my prayer is that these Advent studies we are doing as we're contemplating Advent can indeed help to lead each of us to that perfect light of Jesus in this Advent season. Today, in our study, last week we looked at the shepherds. Today, we're looking at one of the most pivotal figures of the New Testament, about whom we know next to nothing, and from whom we have not a single recorded word of dialogue. And yes, you may already have figured it out. We're talking about Joseph, the husband of Mary, the earthly father of Jesus. Have you ever known somebody that was one of those strong, silent types? One of those men or women who usually aren't the chairman of the group, maybe don't hold any outward position of authority, but they're just those down-to-earth, faithful, serving kind of people, and everybody respects their judgment, whether it's just given with a nod or a smile or a shake of the head, no. And when they do choose to speak, it'll be with an economy of words but with deep thought and meaning. And what they say is usually respected and listened to. These are those people who are people of integrity. And, and I like to think that Joseph must have been that kind of man. And we're going to think a little bit about some of the impressions and lessons that Joseph may have been able to impart to Jesus as Jesus was growing up as the son of a carpenter. Now, I will grant you that these things we're going to share, some of it is just pastoral speculation. Because as I said, we don't have a lot of recorded information by Joseph or about Joseph. But for instance, you remember that Jesus told his disciples that you shall not bear false witness, that their yes should be yes and their no should be no, and that anything beyond this comes from the evil one that was in Matthew chapter 5, around verse 37. Well, you know, I suspect that Joseph was that kind of a man, a man of integrity where his handshake was better than a signed contract, that his word was his bond. And, and certainly, Jesus may well have learned much from watching this earthly father of his. So we're going to look at the few scriptures that tell us a little bit about Joseph as far as some of the things he was involved in and see if we can think a little bit about this man. So we turn first to Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is Matthew's account of the birth of Jesus. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Now, let me explain a little bit. When you were betrothed, it meant that you were legally considered to be husband and wife but you had not yet begun living together under the same roof, and therefore you were not yet consummating the marital relationship through sexual relations. Which is why 
Before they lived together, when she was found to be with child, it would have been a scandalous thing. I mean, Mary knew it was through the Holy Spirit, but a lot of other people in the community would not. And I'm sure there was lots of talking. That's why in verse 19, it says, Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Now, this is one of our keys to the character of Joseph. It says he was a righteous man. A person that desired to do the right thing, sought to treat others in that way. He didn't want to expose her to shame, and that's because he could have had a public spectacle divorcing of Mary. He could have called her before the elders at the gate of the city, and he could have publicly shamed her, said that this woman to whom I'm betrothed is pregnant, and you all know we've not been together, so she's been with someone else. She's betrayed me. She's she shamed herself. She shamed her family. It would have ruined Mary and her family in that community forever. And Joseph would have been well within his rights to do so. It would have even been a righteous thing according to the laws of their day for him to do that. But Joseph saw a righteousness beyond that. Joseph saw a righteousness that said, I'm not just gonna follow the letter of the law. I'm going to look at the intent and the spirit of the law. And so he decided to divorce her quietly. He would simply file the necessary documents, end their betrothal, let her go on her way. She could quietly slip out of town, go have the child somewhere, and everything would be okay. So verse 20 tells us that such was his intention. When, behold, again, God's intervening, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel. That was one of the prophecies from Isaiah, which means, Emmanuel means God is with us. So verse 24 says, when Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. He had no relations with her until she bore a son and he named him Jesus. Now I wanna point out to you several important things here. We know that when Mary was told by the angel Gabriel, you're going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, she accepted this and was obedient. Well, we also find here this man Joseph being open to listening to what God had to say, and then doing it. Now, I don't know about you, but, but if I had a vision like that, uh, uh, I'd like to think I would follow it and obey, but you know, most of us would be a little questioning. We, we, we might just wonder if, if this was really true or not. Did, did we really have this experience? But it says, that Joseph awoke, did as the angel commanded him. And then he was faithful not to have any relationship with her until she had borne the son and indeed did name him Jesus. Now, let's turn over to Matthew chapter two. And again, we see Joseph receiving a heavenly message and responding appropriately. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. When they had departed, this was when the wise men departed, the magi departed after having made their visit. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, 
flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. What do we see again in verse 14? Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He stayed there until the death of Herod, that what the Lord had said through the prophet might be fulfilled. Out of Egypt I called my son. So again, we have Joseph being a man who is open to listen to God, who receives this vision, this message, and again, promptly obeys. Now, again, this is pastoral speculation here, but can you imagine as, as God looked down through the ages and wanted to choose an earthly couple in whom Jesus would incarnate? to be the earthly parents of the Messiah. He would have wanted a couple who were followers of God, who were people open to receive messages from God, and who would then be obedient and faithful when they received such a message. And so apparently Mary and Joseph both fulfilled these requirements. Now, we turn to verses 19 through 23 of Matthew chapter 2. When Herod had died, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. He rose, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judah in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go back there. And because he had been warned in a dream, again, there was a, a, a vision not to go where Herod's son was the ruler. This is not, a, the full vision's not recorded for us, but it, it, it's apparent that there was one. He departed for the region of Galilee, he went and dwelt in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He shall be called a Nazarene. So over and over again, we witness this miraculous occurrence of Mary having been faithful to listen and follow, and Joseph to be faithful and obedient. In all of Scripture, we don't have a single recorded word uttered by Joseph, the husband of Mary, but he listens and he acts. He hears God speak in his dreams and he responds immediately. This was apparently Joseph's style. You remember that he awoke and left with uh, and, and married Mary, took her into his household. In Bethlehem, after Jesus was born, the wise men left, said, you got to go to Egypt. He got up and went. He was obedient. He must have lived very close to God. And of course, when Herod died again, Joseph said to go back, and he did. Then he was told not to go where Archelaus, who was just as brutal and violent as King Herod, his father, uh, not to go to the area of Jerusalem or Judah, so instead he goes to Galilee, to Nazareth. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of us were so immediately obedient to the promptings of the Lord? Joseph and Mary were obedient also to the Mosaic ritual and civil laws. They made that 90-mile journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem, a lot of it possibly on foot, I know a lot of times we portray Mary as riding on the back of a donkey, but we're not even sure they would have had that luxury. They may have had to hoof it the whole way to be registered for that census under Jewish law and therefore subject to Roman taxes, under Roman law and subject to Roman taxes. 
We do know that they circumcised Jesus on the eighth day as prescribed by the law of Moses from the book of Leviticus. And we know that Joseph took Jesus and Mary to Jerusalem for purification 33 days after Mary had finished with the birth process. Now, in Luke 2, where this is described to us, we do know that the upper and middle classes were to donate a lamb, but the poor could dedicate two turtle doves, and that's what Joseph did. It is in Luke 2 that two individuals see Jesus and have a miraculous encounter. An aged holy man named Simeon sees Jesus, becomes ecstatic and cries out, my eyes have seen God's salvation. And also in Luke chapter two, Anna, an elderly widow who would go and pray daily in the temple, saw Joseph and Mary and Jesus, and she gave thanks to God. And yet, here we have Joseph. We don't hear words of complaining. We don't hear words of naysaying. The old spiritual says he never said a mumbling word. And so it seems. But this obedient, faithful man with Mary parented Jesus. And in Luke 2.40, it says, the child grew and became strong filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. We also know that Joseph and Mary brought Jesus back to Jerusalem every year as required for Passover. Now that would not have been an easy nor a cheap pilgrimage. They probably saved for it throughout each year, but they would go and make this pilgrimage. And that was where it says at age 12, Jesus sat with the rabbis and priests, it says in Luke 2, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, I want you to understand something. From everything that I understand theologically, our best understanding of Jesus at this point in his life is that he did not necessarily have the full understanding that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, God in human form. And so he's not knowing how to uh, amaze these rabbis and priests because of some knowledge he gained because he is God in human flesh. But I believe it was because he had learned scripture at the feet of Joseph and Mary. Joseph would have most likely been one of the group of men who formed the nucleus of their local synagogue. And so uh, a Jewish synagogue required 10 head of the family men with a rabbi. And so Nazareth did have a, a synagogue and probably 150 or so people in it, we believe, because that's about what the village had in it, we believe. Uh, it was not a large village by any means. That's why people were so amazed that Jesus would have come from such a humble place as Nazareth. But we know that God uses humble beginnings to do great things. So I believe that Jesus learned scripture from his father and from his mother. Now you'll also remember that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus in the crowd. Now. People have sometimes criticized Mary and Joseph for this, but understand that they're traveling from Jerusalem back to Nazareth in a caravan. You remember the old wagon trains of the American West that we've seen portrayed on television and in movies? Well, it was very much that kind of experience. So this would have been family members. This would have been people from the village, and it was not a large village. Everybody knew one another. And so as they're making the journey from Jerusalem back toward Nazareth, it didn't bother Mary and Joseph that they didn't know exactly where Jesus was because he could have been anywhere within the caravan. I remember growing up, living in a little town of Morgan City, Louisiana. And in that little town, 
Uh, we lived on a street that was a dead-end street. And so there were only our houses on this street. And there was maybe 10, 12 houses on the road. Almost everybody living in there, like my father, were engineers or other people in the oil business. So we all had that common connection. And so numbers of young families, lots of kids my age, and we pretty much have the run up and down the street, anywhere we needed to go. We knew that if the street lights came on, it was time to go home. And it was not uncommon if, if my mom, for instance, needed to, to find me, she'd get on the phone and start calling down to the houses. Is Michael there? Is Michael there? Oh no, they left here 30 minutes ago. They were going to so-and-so's house. Oh, okay, so she calls there. Is Michael there? Yeah, okay, I need him to come home now. All right, and they'd tell me and I'd toddle back home. A different time, a different place, in many ways a, a, a very wonderful place. So they just assumed Jesus was in the caravan. And when they finally realized that he wasn't there, they, they returned to uh, Jerusalem and they found him there in the temple. He had stayed there and Mary said, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. This is in Luke chapter two also. Joseph didn't say a word. Jesus said, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Now, right there, Jesus is beginning to understand that he has a special relationship with God the Father. But it then says Jesus went home and was obedient to them. He was obedient to his earthly mother and father. Isn't that wonderful? that God with us, God in the flesh, was obedient to his earthly mother and father. What a lesson for all of us, no matter what our age, if we're still fortunate to have living parents, that we should respect them and honor them. Now, that is the last time we ever see or hear of Joseph. Never again is Joseph mentioned in Scripture. We don't know what happened. We assume that Joseph probably died, either from illness or from an accident, because it doesn't seem conceivable that this godly man of integrity would have walked out on his family. Let's think a little bit more about Joseph and the influence he might have had on Jesus as Jesus grew up. Now, we think of Joseph as a carpenter and that Jesus himself was a carpenter by trade, having learned it from his father. The Greek word tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N, tekton, that we translate carpenter, literally means an artisan or a builder or a stonemason. And the reason we come up with that term carpenter is because in the King James Bible in 1611, they used the word carpenter, and so it's been that way. But think about it for a minute. And I've been to Israel, I can say this is true. Trees in Israel are in short supply. Solomon, the great king, had to import the cedars of Lebanon to build the temple in Jerusalem. Houses in Galilee are built mainly of limestone but there was still furniture and yokes for oxen and other things that needed to be made of the wood that was available. So we know that Joseph was an artisan, a builder. He was a man who could make things. He could fix what was broken. He could build houses. He knew how to use tools like the hammer, the chisel, the plumb line, the level. And we know that builders are careful, often meticulous. A plumb line makes a wall straight. A level makes a table true. So indulge with me for a moment in some pastoral speculation. Picture Jesus working side by side with Joseph. Joseph saying, son, it has to be perfectly straight. 
And then maybe he said, that's the way God wants us to be with one another. Or Joseph pointing to somebody building a house on sand and saying, when the storms come, that house is gonna fall. It should be level and built on a solid rock foundation. That's the way our lives should be built on God. And there's some speculation that for a while at least, Joseph and probably Jesus with him would have been day laborers in a town called Zipporah. Zipporah was an ancient city built on top of a thousand foot high hill about four miles from Nazareth. It was made the capital of Galilee. And Herod actually served there as district governor before going to Jerusalem for greater responsibilities. Well, after King Herod died, the Jews rioted and captured the city back, but then Herod Antipas put down that revolution, that uprising, and began to rebuild and fortify and modernize Zipporah, restoring the city to its former status as district capital. Had around 40,000 inhabitants. So here you are, you're a craftsman, you're a builder, and you live four miles away from this large urban renewal project that's going on. And the Romans were desperate for skilled workmen. So can't you just see Joseph and perhaps the teenager Jesus walking or riding an ox cart four miles each way to build homes and public buildings? That kind of day labor work has gone on for centuries. Now, what does a father do with a thoughtful, obedient son on a typical work day? What did he and Jesus talk about on that four-mile journey back and forth? Well, I suspect that they probably spoke of God. They probably spoke of the way people can treat one another. Joseph might have taught Jesus the, the ins and outs of human nature and human relationships being honest or cheating people. It's interesting that there was a theater in Zipporah, which would put on plays, which interestingly enough, Jews weren't allowed to see. And Jesus must have learned a lot when he was exposed to the Gentile culture in that town. In his later preaching, he used the word hypocrite spelled exactly the way we spell it today, the hypocrite. And that's not an Aramaic or a Hebrew word. It comes from a Greek word, meaning an actor from the theater. So Jesus referred to some of the religious leaders of his day as play actors, hypocrites. This is probably something that Jesus saw and was exposed to as he and Joseph worked in Zipporah, helping to rebuild that city. Some people have speculated that Joseph may have been an older man when he married Mary. Perhaps he was a lifelong bachelor only marrying for the first time, or perhaps he was a widower and this was a second marriage. Or maybe he just died young. We just don't really know. That last we know of him is Mary and Joseph going with Jesus to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem when Jesus was 12 years old. So we assume that Jesus probably had four or five more years with Joseph, hopefully learning skills and faith and family. And now young Jesus was left to support Mary and the family. Have you ever wondered why Jesus did not begin his ministry until he was 30 years old? Well, there were younger half-brothers and half-sisters that Joseph and Mary had by natural human relationships. They needed to grow up and be able to care for Mary before Jesus went out to begin his ministry. Because Jesus was a man of integrity, just as his father had modeled for him and had taught him. And he was not going to leave his mother uncared for. Now, you remember when Jesus began his ministry after his baptism, 40 days and nights of fasting and prayer and temptation in the wilderness, he went back to Nazareth. And at first, the townspeople welcomed him. He was a local boy, made good, and they asked him to speak in their little synagogue.
But we also know that later, they basically ran him out of town. Nathaniel, one of the followers of Jesus, made the comment, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, he learned it could. Jesus had come out of Nazareth. The Nazarenes, the Nazareth people, the Nazarites, believed that they were special, set apart, a people who had suffered as a root of Jesse and now had come home. Now, Jesus had a radical idea. Jesus taught the radical concept that God is God of all people, both Jews and Gentiles. Certainly, Joseph had taught Jesus the words of Isaiah 45, verse 22. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And Isaiah 49, 6, I will give you as a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So I like to think that Joseph helped his son understand that people are people and all are in need of salvation. So the men in the little synagogue asked Jesus to say a few words after he read scripture. And Jesus dropped a bombshell on his conservative down-home townsfolk. He read Isaiah 61. And then he said, I am the fulfillment of this in God's sight. I just couldn't understand. This was the carpenter's son. This was not someone special, but it was the beginning of a great ministry of our Lord. So we think that Jesus must have learned much from his strong, quiet, hard-working father. We know that Jesus, that Joseph, faithfully kept the Jewish religious laws and ceremonies, and yet he worked with many different kinds of people in many different ways. It's amazing how someone so important and yet so in the shadows for us. And I just wonder, as you and I think about it, do you have someone that you look back on father, a grandfather, an uncle, or maybe an older brother who made that kind of influence on you? Again, thinking about my own home situation. When I was a young man, my father, as an oil field engineer, was considered kind of the troubleshooter for his company in drilling and you know, in, in off the coast of Louisiana, in the Gulf of Mexico, they do a lot of offshore drilling. So it would not be uncommon when I was a young child that I'd hear the phone ring in the dark of the night, and I'd hear my dad answer the phone and some words exchanged, and when I got up the next morning, dad was gone. He had been called out to some rig onshore or very often out in the Gulf of Mexico he might be gone a few days, he might be gone a few weeks, depending on what the problem was and what it took to solve it. And so my mother did have a tremendous influence on me because she was the, the parent whom I was with more often as a young man. But you know, as I've grown older, and I look in the mirror as I shave in the morning. It's my dad I see looking back at me. It's my dad whose words and influence I often remember most. And I always give him thanks. He's been gone a long time now, but I always give him thanks for what he planted in me. 
And then, of course, there's a reverse question for all of us men to think about. And that is, what kind of an influence are you being on the children around you? What kind of influence are you being on the teenagers around you? You're being watched. Whether you like it or not, you're being watched. So let's remember that the words we say, the actions we take, the things we do can have powerful meaning to those around us. May we all be the kind of men that Joseph was. And ladies, may you all be the kind of person that Mary was, obedient and willing to do as God called. And that's perhaps the, the, the best message for all of us, men or women, that we be open to listening when God speaks, that we be willing to obey, and that we be faithful servants. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this study we have been able to share together. We ask now that you would help each of us to learn from contemplating Advent, that we might be drawn closer to that great light, the light of Jesus, God with us, that we celebrate in this holy season. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining us, folks. Next week, we'll have our third and final Advent study. I hope to see you then. Bye.